We are going to cover some alignment topics here. Let's see if I can make this a little bigger. So alignment is really central to most genomic research, a lot of bioinformatics. It's like one of the main kind of alignments or one of the main currencies of, of genomic research, basically. And so this kind of like really high level workflow is super common, right? You have your DNA or RNA samples of interest and you send them for sequencing and you probably get back FASTQ files and you do some kind of alignment, alignment to the genome, to the transcriptome. Uh, you might do some quality control like we just did. And then these green boxes, it's like find peaks, quantify transcripts, identify structural variants, dot, 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 dot. So there's like probably hundreds or thousands of analysis applications that take as input alignments, read alignments. And then that's what allows you to do phase two through a hundred, which is analysis and interpretation and discovery. So the magic of alignment, um, really one thing we're leveraging, right, is the reference genome. So we've talked about this, but you can kind of think of alignment as about fitting kind of individual pieces or reads into the right part of the puzzle or the reference genome. And the Human Genome Project really gave us kind of the picture on the box, right? So we know kind of what the genome looks like. And when we find a small piece, we have some hope of figuring out where it came from because we have that reference genome. And then we could also start to think about like subtle differences between the sequences that we're getting from our reads, from our sample versus the reference genome. And maybe those represent variation, either common germline variation or rare somatic or germline variation um, or other kinds of variants. And we can also use it to do things like quantify the expression of gene loci, which is what this is all about. RNA-seq uh, alignment has its challenges. Um, this, some of these are less so than they were once upon a time, but there is still some amount of computational cost involved because you are aligning hundreds of millions of reads. Uh, obviously with RNA-seq, you're aligning mRNA typically. Um, so you have to think about introns, right? We've already alluded to this, but you may want to consider like a splice aware alignment to account for the fact that some of your reads are going to maybe span millions of bases, which is a different problem than when you're aligning DNA reads. Um, we kind of wish we could just align our data once using one approach and be done with it, but unfortunately this is still not the case you may find yourself realigning your data for different downstream applications. So in our world, for example, when we do um, like fusion discovery, sometimes we will realign the RNA data in a special way that is more amenable to discovering fusions um, than doing gene expression estimation. There are at least three kind of high level RNA-seq mapping strategies. Um, which can be broadly broken into de novo assembly, uh, alignment to a transcriptome, and alignment to a reference genome. And you might ask, well, which one is best? So for a de novo assembly, this is something you may do if you don't have a reference genome. So you have RNA reads, but you don't have a reference to align it against, or maybe even known transcripts. So you're basically like trying to infer the transcript structure for the first time from your data. And that's basically like an assembly problem. Uh, if you have a reference genome or transcriptome, but you have very short reads, it used to be common to adopt a strategy of aligning directly to the transcriptome. So you're basically like taking the um, gene annotations and creating like an in silico like spliced version of the reference and aligning directly to the transcript sequence to get around that problem of trying to align across large introns, which was challenging to do when you had very short reads. Now we mostly have longer reads that aren't suffering from that problem as much. So like typically you're getting 100 or 150 or even longer reads now. Um, so in most cases, when you have reads of that length, you can do the last strategy, which is aligned to the reference genome, if you have a reference genome. And that's by far, I would say, the most common um, strategy now. And that's what we're going to be covering in this workshop. So which aligner should I use? We actually talked about this. This used to be much more of a question. So there were over the years, dozens or maybe hundreds of aligners that were invented for different applications. 
Um, but now for RNA, there's maybe only a couple options you would probably consider. And for DNA, there's sort of like one main option that most people consider, unless you're doing some specific application, uh, a very specific application. So should I use a splice aware or unspliced um, or non-splice aware aligner? The answer is probably use a splice aware. So um, this is just a review. The fragments that we're sequencing are mRNA, um, entrants are removed, uh, but we're usually aligning those reads back to the reference genome. So again, unless you have really short reads, you're probably gonna wanna take advantage of a splice aware aligner like HiSAT or STAR. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. So really quickly, we're gonna go through how HiSAT conceptually works as an aligner. So HiSAT is a splice aware read aligner. Um, it stands for hierarchical indexing for spliced alignment of transcripts. It does require a reference genome. It, it is quite fast, relatively speaking. It uses an indexing scheme based on the Burrow-Wheeler transform and the Ferragini-Manzini index that some of those smart Italians and Malachi was probably referring to before. Um, and basically, at a high level, this is taking advantage of multiple types of indexes. So we've actually indexed our data for, H, for HiSAT, right? We created those like HT files um, using the HiSAT build command. That was basically making the indexes that we're gonna talk about in the next few slides, uh, which makes kind of like the, the magic of HiSAT work. So it involves a whole genome wide, a large whole genome wide index, numerous smaller local indexes, um, and then it also takes into account kind of information about known polymorphisms or known transcript structures to improve the efficiency of splice aware alignment. So it uses this hierarchical indexing algorithm and some adaptive strategies based on the position of a read with respect to splice sites. And so there's kind of like a few steps, but basically it, it finds candidate locations across the whole genome first, mapping part of each read using that global index, and hopefully it will identify just one or a small number of candidate locations in the genome, and then it switches to this more sensitive local alignment with these local indexes. So it actually has one big index and 48,000 local indexes that it uses um, to find the final alignment. And then with pair reads, it map, map, maps each read separately. Uh, but if a read fails to align, then the alignments of its mate are used to kind of anchor the unaligned mate. So if you succeed with one, it can help you to solve the problem of the other if it can't be aligned easily on its own. So they provide in the uh, like very detailed paper of HiSAT2 um, some kind of like graphical depictions of this process to try to make it a little bit more understandable. So we're looking at like a very simplified scenario here where you have a little piece of the chromosome. Coincidentally, they're also looking at chromosome 22. Um, and it, let's just imagine that there's two exons here and an unrealistically small looking intron. And then you have some reads that map either within an exon or across an exon, exon boundary, but just a little bit, or kind of like really across the boundary. And so let's kind of walk through what the steps of the aligner would be for these three different scenarios. So in the, the case of the, the first read, this, this guy, it's a kind of a simple situation. So this read is fully contained within an exon. It starts by doing this global search using the global index. So it's searching for a read position uh, with this first global index, and it's looking for a match of at least 28 base pairs long. So that's this little blue section. And as soon as it finds at least one match in across the whole genome that it's at least 28 bases, um, it says, okay, I found like the place where this read likely belongs. And then it uses just a simple extension step. So this first part is, is really slow. So looking at all kind of all possible 28 MERS in one of those index files and looking to say, okay, where does this 28 bases match? That is like a pretty slow process. Um, but as soon as it finds that match, it can switch to a much faster process of extension where it basically says, okay, if this 28 bases matches here, 
then why don't I just check and see if the 29th base matches the reference genome? And if it matches, it just says, okay, that, that's probably where this whole read belongs. And it just keeps doing that and extending. And if it gets to the end of the read, it's like placed the whole read and it has the full alignment. And that's kind of done for this simple scenario. But in the more complex situation where the read is spanning an exon exon boundary, it has to do some extra steps, right? So it first again tries to map the read using the global search, uh, moving from right to left. That's this little blue part. Um, it tries to find this first 28 base pairs, find at least one place where at least 28 base pairs matches. And that kind of anchors the alignment using this global index. And then it switches to the local index and does a more sensitive alignment. So actually, first we'll do that extension step. So in this case, it found where this 28 base pairs belongs using the global index. Then it's like, let's just check and see if the bases match in the reference. So it'll just like do a simple extension operation. In this case, it like starts mismatching, right? So it gets to this exon intron boundary and it's like, oh, these reference bases don't match anymore. So that's when it reverts to the local index to find where this remaining eight base pairs matches. So if you were to think about this little eight base pair chunk, if you were to start with that and ask like where in the whole genome it could match, there would probably be like thousands of places, right? Because eight base pairs is not very big, it's not very unique. But because you've now like constrained yourself to this much smaller space, like you know from this first part that you're in kind of this region of the genome, you flip to one of these smaller, much more focused indexes, and you can find um, where that eight, eight base pairs matches using like a different search against that smaller index. And then it does like some compatibility checks. Like it says, well, let's make sure that this eight base pair part and this larger part are like consistent with the known splice sites and that they're consistent with like the sort of direction that of, that's consistent with the read. So you wouldn't want a thing where like this section is like aligning in one way and then the eight base pairs is like flipped relative to that. That would not be like a consistent alignment, right? So it does some checks like that. And if all that checks out, then it's like, okay, I've found this where this read belongs and I've created an like a appropriate spliced alignment for it. The last situation is just a little bit more complicated than that um, in that it does that first 28 base pair search to find at least hopefully just one place in the genome with at least 28 base pair match, which kind of anchors it so they can use the faster, um, smaller local indexes. It does that extension operation. Again, it runs out of matching bases, uh, but it has this smaller local index to look in to find this eight base pair match nearby. And then for this, the eight base pairs is not enough to complete the alignment. So it does another extension operation to extend this eight pairs base pairs into a longer alignment. And then again, checks for compatibility. And if that all checks out, it's like, okay, I've placed this, this spliced alignment that's really kind of split almost evenly across the two axons. So HiSAT's basically like using this combination of clever indexes and heuristics to do these splice aware alignments. What do you get at the end of that? You get a SAM BAM file. Um, I think we're going to dig into the format of that file when we get to it. So it'll be like another mini lecture where we're going to like dig into the, the format of the SAM BAM file. Uh, but just to introduce you to the concept, this is basically the, the format. It's called sequence alignment map format. The BAM file is just the compressed or binary version of the SAM file. And actually now we're mostly using what are called CRAM files, which is a more efficiently compressed version of the SAM file that takes advantage of information with the reference genome. Uh, you can read, we have some links to like information on how to convert between BAM and SAM or between CRAM and BAM, or CRAM and SAM. Um, and there's an, like another link to a post about other kind of uh, mapper options. But that's like a super quick introduction to the high side aligner. And now we're gonna actually like take our raw sequence data and start um, doing some alignments, although we, we're going to do a couple things before that to like prepare for aligning. Does anyone have any questions about that before we do the last practical section of the day?